Okay, so now it's being recorded and we wait. Yes. So I can still leave my presentation on screen, right? Or should yeah, I? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. No problem at all. So Axel, have you received the medallion actually? Uh, actually, I wanted to show you this. Of course, here it is. Yes, because I was I going to it, ask I you. It, I'm info. very proud. I got it. I got it perfect in time. Uh, Excellent. So I'll ask you to show that maybe. Sure, I will do that. I I, I wanted to wanted to do that anyways. To prove. For those of you joining. Uh, let me just say, for, for those of you joining, let me just say, I see there are 41 attendees already that will wait for a few more minutes uh, to officially start at 35 past. Bodhi with the... Uh, extra requirements chairing such a session, uh, uh, I feel that session chairs need to receive something as well. <laughs> At least you need to receive something. Absolutely. <laughs> Bodhi, Bodhi gave a wonderful seminar a few weeks ago at our place and I, I owe him a, a beautiful dinner, which we definitely will do when we get the possibility to meet in person next time. All I remember of that talk is I showed a lot of cricket videos. That was wonderful. Oh. Thanks, thanks.
let's give it one more minute. I suggest since usually there's a phase transition right on the dot. Okay, so I think we can slowly get started. Hello, everyone. My name is Victor Pernartos. I will be chairing this session today. And it is my great pleasure and indeed an honor to introduce Professor Axel Munch. Axel will give one of eight prestigious medallion lectures at this JSM. And normally on this occasion, I would present Axel with a medal on behalf of the IMS, but given the circumstances, of course, this is not possible. And I believe he has already received it. I don't know if you can show us, Axel. Sure, I'm, I'm very proud and, and happy to, to show you this, this beautiful medal, which just came right in time. Congratulations, uh, uh, um, Axel. And let me just say a few words about Axel. Axel did his undergraduate and PhD studies at the University of Göttingen in Germany. And then he held research fellowships in Dresden, in Cornell, and at UPenn, where he was very much influenced by Barry Brown. He completed his habilitation in Bochum, and after assistant and associate professorships in Bochum and Paderborn, he returned to Göttingen as full professor. And today he holds there the Felix Bernstein Chair for Mathematical Statistics and directs the uh, corresponding institute. I should say he's also concurrently affiliated with the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry. He is a fellow of the IMS, an elected member of the ISI, and a fellow of the Max Planck Society. And his research interests are broad and varied. So in terms of statistics uh, proper, uh, mathematical statistics, he's very interested in multi-scale methods, statistical inverse problems, and optimal transport. But he's also interested in uh, applications of statistics, statistics in biophysics, therapeutic equivalence, super resolution imaging, biometric identification, and ion channel analysis. And I think this is one of the things that distinguish Axel. He's, of course, a leading figure in mathematical statistics with deep contributions to the field. But at the same time, he can go from deep theory to substantive applications, as, as you can imagine from the interests that I just um, described. And let me just give you two examples. He's made important contributions to the analysis of ion channels uh, and the implementation of statistical methods that can be used to model and evaluate electrophysiological data at small temporal scales. At the same time, another example is contributions to fingerprint analysis and their evolution based on statistical shape theory has actually made a splash as his methods allowed to identify criminals that had previously been able to evade um, the system. Um, I would also like to mention that Axel is a devoted mentor and has helped both students and early career scientists, something that I personally know well. So, before um, I, I close, um, I would like to mention some practical issues um, with regards to questions in particular. Um, we will not take questions during the lecture. However, we will take a break halfway through the lecture uh, to take some questions and then again at the end. Uh, if you do wish to ask a question, you can raise your hand in Zoom using the functionality that says raise hand. I will keep track of that uh, and, and then I will give you the floor. I will unmute you. Alternatively, you can post a question to the chat uh, in Zoom. This is uh, 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 one other way. Uh, there is a third way, which is to use the polls function in Pathable, uh, but the chat in Zoom is preferable um, if you're able to do that. Um, we will have plenty of discussion time, so you know, I encourage you to please uh, chime in and ask your questions. I look forward to um, a lively exchange. And now without further ado, I would like to invite Axel to deliver his medallion lecture on empirical optimal transport. Thank you very much, Axel. Over to you. Well, thanks, Vic, for that very kind introduction. So uh, 
after what you said, I'm not sure whether it can, can meet the expectations of the auditorium, but, but anyway, so this is just great. And it's a great honor, of course, to receive the uh, medallion of the IMS. Uh, in fact, I'm indebted to the IMS for, for uh, many things over the, over the last years, a wonderful society. So in this talk, I'd like to address some aspects of, uh, well, optimal transport um, from the viewpoint, let's say, of data analysis. And in fact, this is a, a rapidly developing area which, which has somehow perceived great interest in the last years, mainly at the cutting edge of statistics, machine learning, and optimization. Um, I will only touch a, a very few selective and completely subjectively chosen topics related to my own work. And I'd like to stress that much more should and could be said. In fact, if you attended Philip Rigolet's talk, uh, this was in a, in a sense quite complementary and we were in contact with each other actually. Uh, he made talk mainly from the viewpoint of, let's say a continuous formulation of the optimal transport problem. So my talk will be much more elementary uh, in most parts. And as most of the time my setting will be just discrete or even just a finite number of data. So let me also mention that this, this, this work and talk results from various collaborations over the, over the past. And I'm extremely grateful to all uh, of, of my collaborators for sharing their time and, and ideas with me. So the talk will start in the first two sections. And here's again that with a very intuitive, hopefully intuitive and light introduction to the topic to illustrate some of the basic ideas, which however, I think are very fundamental also then to more advanced topics of optimal transport. So the second uh, chapter provides several characterizations of optimal transport dating back to Leonid Kantorovich's famous work in the 30s and 40s of the last century. And this part is, is in, in, in fact intended for those who may, maybe heard about optimal transport the first time. And it provides still the basis for what follows in, in which I discuss some aspects of optimal transport more related to data analysis. This will concern computational aspects and, and some statistical issues, uh, which I believe might be useful for inferential purposes. And in section five, I'd like to discuss a little more detailed one particular application from cell biology. And finally, if time permits, I, I would like to sketch some recent concepts of describing dependency measures based on on optimal transport. So, well, in fact, the original idea underlying optimal transport uh, is, is more than 200 years around, uh, dating back to the great French physicist and mathematician, Gaspard Monge, who stated it, among others, as a physical mass transportation problem. And one way to formulate it is how to move a pile of sand in the most efficient way into one another. So think of, you pick each grain of sand and try to, 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 to move it to the, to the other pile, and you would like to do it in a, in a cost efficient way, whatever cost means at, at, at that stage, maybe energy, in most energy efficient way uh, to, to minimize the total energy to do that. Marsh, in fact, uh, who was very close with uh, Napoleon, uh, had also many other applications in mind, which are related to the optimal allocation of resources. And I will come back to this a little later. So in fact, uh, Gaspar Moore certainly uh, was a century scientist and, and politically also very influential. Among many, many other achievements, he founded the, the, call, the famous Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. So when you visit Paris, which I got the opportunity to do two years ago, you literally see Moore everywhere. So he's honored at many places. For example, his name is engraved in the Eiffel Tower just next to Ponson. Among many other honorable distinctions, a street and, and a metro station even in Paris is named after him. Well, maybe the most prestigious and difficult thing for a scientist to achieve still is that even a cafe is, is named after him. Uh, so he obviously made that uh, achievement as well. Well, over the time, it turned out that Moore's original problem is in a sense extremely difficult to solve. Uh, and in many cases doesn't have really a solution. Always the question when such an optimal solution exists was and still is surprisingly complicated. And I will not go into detail on this. Um, 
The next big step, in a sense, then had been taken by the Russian mathematician and economist uh, Leonid Kantorovich in the 30s and 40s of the last century. He relaxed uh, in a very smart way and reformulated most transportation problem in terms of modern measure theory, which then allowed to circumvent, in a sense, many, many difficulties encountered with the original formulation. Well, this laid the foundations of linear programming, as you uh, probably know, and uh, also for economic theory for crisis, which is directly linked to what is called duality. We will come to that. Well, then his work was awarded in the mid 70s jointly with Kultmann for their contributions to the theory of optimal allocation of resources uh, with a Nobel Prize in uh, economy. So, since its early days, the field actually had experienced an enormous, deep, and broad development in many directions, ranging from optimization and econometric theory to PDE theory, differential geometry, probability, of course, various areas of applications. Among these many achievements of great scientists working optimal trends, let me just mention the two fields medalists, uh, Cedric Villani and Alessio Figali. Many monographs are available nowadays, some of them really classic, covering all these different aspects. And I'm certainly not the right person to talk uh, on many of these aspects. Well, from a, from a data analysis point of view, uh, algorithmic advances to solve the corresponding optimization problems are of particular importance. And more recently, in fact, these have influenced the development significantly. While in the days of Kantorovich and, and Georg Danzig, the, the founder of the simplex algorithm to solve a general linear program, let's say problems with a few hundred variables and constraints were practically impossible to solve, modern algorithms and, and also, of course, computer technology allows to treat us nowadays problems of the site of, let's say, a few millions on a laptop. Well, in fact, many of the possibilities that we can expect from optimal transport as, as a tool for data analysis will crucially depend on further computational progress. But of course, it's the same hand also on the development of smart statistical methodology, which somehow has to go hand in hand. So the question I would like to address a little in this talk is, is there a principal way to use optimal transport as a method for statistical valid data analysis? And then does optimal transport somehow help to obtain insight, let's say into particularly complex data, for example, having geometric structure? So as mentioned in the beginning in this talk, I will mainly take the point of view of finite or then later maybe a discrete, that means countable optimal transport problems which in its most elementary way, uh, and let's have a look at this, is just a simple, com well, simple, a combinatorial optimization problem, which is simple to state, but not easy to solve. So imagine the following task. Um, let's say we have uh, certain goods in seven blue boxes. In this case, these are seven boxes, and they have to be distributed to seven places, let's say, uh, represented by the red boxes. So you may think of, the places as pizza locations, uh, let's say, so the blue pizzerias and, and the red boxes are red hungry students which have ordered uh, a pizza. So at this stage, let me mention that all the pizzas are the same. So there is no distinguishing between pepperoni and mozzarella, they all get the same stuff. And let's say just a simple pizza with cheese uh, and it is also not allowed uh, to split pizzas. So that means the entire content of a blue box has to be assigned to a red box. So in this sense, the boxes are elementary particles like the grains of sand or whatever, which cannot be split further. So sharing a pizza even to your best friend is not allowed at this stage. So there is a particular um, bubble box here. And this means that here are two pizzas uh, and they have been ordered exactly at the same place. So for example, they could be requested by the two pizza bakers themselves, right? Because they want to eat two pizzas also. So obviously each possibility how to deliver such a pizza amounts to a mapping between the blue and the red boxes. And a mapping between the blue and the red boxes is just a permutation of, let's say the seven numbers if you give each box a number from one to seven. Well, now if you do want to allocate the blue to the red boxes, that means in a sense you want to deliver in a, in a, in a, in a certain way that a cost functional has to be minimized. 
for example, the total cost or, or the total length of delivery or total time of delivery or whatever, this becomes a combinatorial optimization problem. Well, without any further thinking, uh, you would have to find the optimal permutation minimizing that total cost function. And here you have seven factorial possibilities, which are already more than 5,000. So the, in fact, the combinatorial complexity of that problem increases exponentially with the number of boxes or the number of students or number of pizzas. Well, if, if you like, uh, and if we would have uh, more time, I, I could let you try to go through this combination and find maybe the, 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 the optimal uh, allocation uh, of uh, pizzas and students. And uh, let's say at the moment we consider just simple Euclidean costs, that means just the spatial distance. You could of course also employ other cost functions. For example, if you deliver in New York, then maybe you want to have the L1 matrix, the Manhattan cost. So I have pre-computed already the solution for you. So let me show what comes up. Well, the, the first thing, and this is what I just call a, a shift is, and that's what you probably would also do is you would take uh, one of this blue box, for example, and just shift it to that red one. So this student gets just that one delivered and this blue box moves to this one. That's what I call a simple shift. In the next step, uh, it becomes a little more tricky. Uh, there is a long distance where this box travels and then there is small distance which I've just shifted. So going one step further, what happens with our pizza bakers themselves, well, they will just eat what they, what they did. So there is nothing to move and the transportation cost for Euclidean distance is just zero. Well, you could have guessed this or maybe a, a similar solution. Uh, now let me do the following. Let me make the cost a little bit more complicated. Let's take squared Euclidean cost. Well, that means obviously long distances are more expensive in a sense, right? So what would you guess what, what will happen? Well, the answer is simple, nothing. It's exactly the same solution. Well, now let me play this game a little further and let me take cubic cost. So cubic cost means I take the Euclidean norm to the power of three and let's see what comes out now. So the first thing what happens is in fact, the long distance traveling will be removed. Why? Because to the power of three is now so expensive, a long distance is now so expensive that this is avoided with, for the optimal solution. And then those which are associated to that, uh, these are small traveling distance are also removed. And then finally, and this is maybe a little surprising, it's even not the optimal thing to do that the pizza bakers eat the pizza they just made. In fact, the solution is the following, one box travels to the pizza bakers and then it travels actually through and will be further shifted and only one pizza stays with the pizza maker. Well, that's the solution for the cubic Euclidean cost. So the take home message is that obviously very much the solution of this problem depends on the cost function you're employing. And second, um, if you think more abstractly in terms of the pizzas are now maybe clouds of data or more complicated data structures, then optimal transport aims to match, first of all, assembles of objects in a cost-efficient manner. And cost, we will see, can be something very general. So in fact, uh, if you think of optimal transport as a basis for, let's say, similarity measures, um, then what we have seen is that optimal transport takes the ground distance in a sense into account. That would be, for example, here's a spatial distance which we encode in the cost function. For example, if you would compare this to probability metrics, let's say I rescale everything such that I have a probability distribution, then the, the TV norm would be just one and the kullback leibler distance would be infinity just to the discreteness of the data. So the so optimal transport cost in this case is, is actually very simple or the optimal transport, which you would just guess uh, that blue ones would be shifted to the, to, the, to the next one, which is red. And uh, if you rescale everything proportionally, then for example, if you want to match this black 
structure here to the red one, then everything will be shifted accordingly just by six times the length. Uh, not six times, sorry, proportional to the, to the length. Um, now, if you, and this already leads maybe to, to the idea of Kantorovich. Now, if you do the following, if you think that particles which sit very nearby on a, on a larger scale just contributes to, to contribute, let's say, to a bigger piece of mass, which you may consider as a unit, then what one would expect is that optimal transport should allow, in a sense, for a smooth transition to a continuous formulation, which then is called measure transport. And this is, in fact, true in a sense. So let me come to Kantorovich's uh, description of the problem. Uh, and this is, uh, first of all, uh, what I call the Marsh problem which is what we actually considered so far, the optimal assignment problem. So the pizzas are not allowed to be split and there is exactly as many pizzas as students. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between pizzas and students. And this is a Marsh problem. You try to find the optimal matching that means renumbering or assignment with respect to the cost functional C among all possible permutations of pieces. This is the way to describe it. That's what I call the Marsh problem. And Kantorovich then did the following. Uh, he relaxed the problem in a certain sense. So what he did is he replaced, in a sense, the permutation, the permutation group or the permutation matrices by general probability measures, which are just here, doubly stochastic matrices. And the marginals uh, at that point are just uniform. So that means the rows and the columns should just sum up to one. And then a double stochastic matrix just given by an ensemble of weights, let's say Aij, larger than zero, which sum up row-wise and column-wise to one. So here is another formulation, and this is maybe not so obvious. Uh, and this is called the dual formulation or the dual problem. So let's say we have two point sets, again, uh, the same number uh, and the cost function. And then I introduce a dual, uh, which is now supremum over all possible, well, functions, but here is just vectors, such that the difference of phi and psi is less or equal to the cost of at x and y. And if you take the soup over all these possible vectors you can think of, then this is called the dual. And in fact, this is all very much related uh, to each other. And uh, you can also think maybe in, of the dual in, in terms of supply and demand. Well, minimizing transport costs in a sense is maximizing profit. And this is what is somehow reflected in this dual case. And in this simple setting for finite sets, the Kantorovich theorem just reads as follows. All the three formulations are the same. So that means a Mosh solution, corresponds to the Kantorovich corresponds, corresponds to the dual solution. Or more precisely, the values are the same. And if one uh, attains an optimum, then the others do. And in this simple setting for, for finite uh, samples or for, for a finite space, uh, there always exists a solution. So let me give a, a, a very quick argument why that should be true. Well, the, the first thing is that the assignment equals Kantorovich formulation with a double stochastic matrix. So what you here use is actually that the extremal points of the double stochastic matrices, or that's one way to prove it, uh, are just actually given by the permutation matrices. And this is just third cross theory. And then you use that the space where you optimize, which is the space of all those matrices with these marginal constraints uniform, is a convex space. And then you use a standard argument because you have a linear optimization problem that a maximum is a 10. If you want to see the uh, equality between Kantorovich or Mosh uh, and the dual dualities, then the first thing is that obviously D is always less or equal to K. That's called weak duality. Uh, and in a sense, you could say, well, each price the delivery service requests um, must be less than, than, let's say, my own transportation cost. Uh, which else I wouldn't do this deal. Uh, and then M in the primal 
it is, is, is a primal problem in the language of linear programming. So the difficult case is to show actually that P is less or equal to D. And I will not give a, a proof here. Uh, actually, uh, at the heart is uh, the, also, in a sense, which is at the, at the, one way to prove Birkhoff's theorem, at the heart is an argument which exclude actually for solution cycles. And uh, you can show the following that um, the, in the system of inequalities, uh, which, we, which we have to, to show to hold for the, for the dual, uh, here the Bij's uh, would be the, the cost, let's say Cij's, uh, with vectors uh, uh, lambda one to lambda n uh, is actually solvable uh, exactly if the following condition holds, and this is uh, uh, what is called C cyclic monotonicity. The C addresses the cost function, and that means uh, it's a it's a certain monotonicity of the underlying structure. So a, a, a very elementary and nice proof is given uh, uh, in a paper by Bracey's, but of course there are many variants and, and, and different types of proof. Uh, nowadays available. So as I said, this somehow set the, the foundations for, for linear programming. Uh, and in the language of linear programming, you would just rewrite uh, that whole um, optimization problem uh, in terms of uh, a, a, a big matrix A uh, and a vector B, uh, which encodes actually the uh, constraint that, and then you, you look for all, um, or you, you, you try to minimize the linear cost function among all, um, let's say, transport plans, which are now encoded here as a vector. So you would re rewrite everything in terms of a vector, uh, which has to be non-negative. Um, maybe what is important to mention here is uh, that, in fact, um, the matrix A, if you write it this way, uh, is of dimension 2n times n squared. And B is a, a vector of, of 2n ones, if, if you do it with a unit, uh, unit marginal measures. Um, so uh, you optimize over, effectively, that's what we've seen before, over an intersection of hyperplanes. So it's, uh, it's a polyhedron. Uh, and the solution uh, has to be attained uh, on one of these corners, but usually in general, it's not yet. Uh, important is also maybe to mention that um, if the cost uh, is induced by a metric, for example, the Euclidean metric we, we, we saw before, uh, then duality becomes in a sense particularly simple, just use the triangle inequality. And then you see that um, this inequality has to hold also in the other direction. And then immediately you, understand that uh, this has to do uh, with uh, the Lipschitz uh, uh, modulus of the, let's say, vectors here with respect to D. Uh, so you try to uh, maximize among all one Lipschitz functions or vectors in our setting uh, to find uh, or to solve the dual problem. So K, as a relaxation of M, I said that in fact the Marsh problem, and that can easily be seen uh, that this usually doesn't have a solution when you do things more general. For example, let's assume that the two data sets or the two ground spaces uh, just are of different size, uh, then you cannot find a, a optimal permutation. Uh, and then in this case, uh, this relaxation is a, a one way. Uh, uh, in fact, to, to generalize. Uh, and that's what I will focus on in this talk. But let me also say that uh, there is other concepts like partial transport and unbalanced transport, uh, which, for example, try to find a good subset, uh, which then satisfies this matching property. And I will not address this. And there is a huge literature on this as well, of course. Also, Kontorovich already considered that and, 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 and many people. Um, another thing to mention uh, in the following, what, what I need in the following it occasionally is that also if M equals K is, is not always possible uh, to, to, to generalize, 
and th that's actually a deep theory on, on when does a Morse map exist. And there is a lot of analytical theory in that, uh, which, which, which I don't know much about. Uh, but the um, duality or the correspondence between the dual formulation and the Kantorowicz formulation, the primal problem, uh, that can be um, actually extended uh, to large generality. And that's very useful. Uh, for example, uh, if you, uh, let's say, have a reasonable cost function, lower semi-continuous, and you work in uh, Polish uh, probability measure spaces, uh, then you can show uh, that this minimization problem now for general marginal measures or distributions, probability measures or distributions new and new, uh, that the solution is attained in a, in a, in a weak sense. Uh, and well, computation is another issue. Uh, and that follows uh, from tightness actually of the set of transfer plans in this setting uh, using proper theory. Here's another uh, comment. Uh, what you can do now is uh, you can, of course, uh, understand or view optimal transport in the Kantorowicz formulation uh, as, as searching for a, for a specific coupling between random variables. Right? So what you do effectively is you have random variables X and Y, which have a marginal distribution, given marginal distributions or measures, let's say mu and u. And now what I try to do is I try to minimize the expected cost um, of X and Y under all possible transport plans, uh, which now uh, just means here couplings of, 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 of these probability measures in this general uh, setting, and you, you can view it this way. Um, in fact, um, this allows you, or optimal transport allows you uh, to define uh, a metric on the space of, of uh, that's certainly what most of you know, on the space of, of, of uh, probability measures with, with, let's say, a peak moment. Uh, and this often I abbreviate with WP. And, and if I write WP, then I mean usually that there is an underlying uh, metric space. Uh, or even the Euclidean metric to the power of p. And if you then take the p square root, you get uh, a metric. Um, and that's and this space, all, all measures where this expectation is finite uh, is then called uh, the p plus standard space. Uh, that in, that this is a metric, in fact, relies on one way to prove it is uh, using the gluing lemma that you can uh, actually, for given uh, transport uh, plans uh, or couplings, uh, you can construct another one on the joint space with the corresponding marginals. And this has been, of course, used a lot in, 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 in many aspects of, of, of probability theory in, in related areas. Uh, so you can matrize uh, weak convergence, for example, together with convergence of these moments. Uh, and there is a plethora of work on that. Uh, very nice uh, classical proof uh, by Bickel and Friedman uh, to get from this uh, uh, a bootstrap central limit theorem in dual Lipschitz theory. So let me stay much more elementary uh, and, and go through a few explicit examples. And then we will have maybe a little break uh, and, and see whether questions come in. Um, the most simple case you maybe can think of is uh, that the underlying set has a total ordering structure. So think of points on the, on the reels. Let's say n point uh, n real valued points which have an ordering structure, uh, and then you can easily see by let's say a simple perturbation argument uh, that actually if you want to match here the blue and the red points, uh, you just look let's say for the next neighbor, and this is true when the cost function let's say is is a convex uh, cost function or negative, uh, and then uh, if you now number these points and, and, and write it in terms, let's say, of order statistics. So the, the, the most to the left blue one would be x1 and x, the next one x2 and so on. Uh, so you see that you can express obvious solution just in the difference of the empirical quantile functions. And if you then uh, bravely go to, to a continuous formulation, which in a sense uh, you, you, you can do, there are other ways to, to, to prove that, more, more clever ways to prove that, but that would be one straightforward way. Uh, then you actually you can show that uh, the infimum is in fact attained, uh, or the solution uh, of this optimal transfer problem is in fact attained then uh, for uh, the average over that convex cost function, 
apply to the inverse uh, or the quantile functions of the corresponding measures uh, uh, in, in distributions, let's call it F and G. And here in this case, there is also an explicit transport map. So, so in a sense, the, um, uh, the, the coupling uh, uh, concentrates on, on a function. Uh, and uh, this is just, just given uh, by uh, the quantile function of F applied to G in that formulation. Um, so uh, you could also call this, or it's called a monotone rearrangement. Um, as soon as you leave this totally ordered structure, uh, just when you go to the circle, things become already more complicated. So here, for example, is a situation uh, when uh, the ground space is a circle. You can also write down this uh, actually, of course, for finite numbers uh, of, of, of points, uh, but that's then the formulas just become very nasty. So, um, and then uh, you can actually show that uh, you have, well, let's say you have to match in a sense a mass uh, surrounding these on these circles in, in, in a proper way. And then you can, can show that uh, this is uh, given uh, by the integral in, in, in the specific case, actually, when the cost function is really L1, so absolute value, uh, then given by the difference of the distribution function minus the level median of the difference of these functions. Uh, and uh, the level uh, median is describes somehow the, the median of, of, of the levels with respect to the bit measure. Uh, so the equal mass is distributed to the left or, or mass is distributed to the left and to the right in, in, in the same way. Um, it's actually very difficult to, 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 to generalize already from there. Uh, and uh, to my best of my knowledge, if you go to, to other cost functions, uh, then no closed form expressions exist anymore. Uh, but algorithmic solutions do exist. So let me illustrate that uh, uh, what happens here maybe with uh, uh, an illustration or an application of Max Kent's displacement interpolation, where I distribute the mass uh, from the blue measure uh, to, the, to, the, um, to the red one. And then you, she, you if, if you do that in a way uh, that, um, let's say, the, um, that, that you, at each point, uh, let, let, let the mass which is transported flow at the, at the same time scale, uh, then you get to see how this mass is, or that's a way to visualize how this mass uh, is transported. There is many generalizations of that, uh, for example, recent work by Luana. Let me come to another very important uh, explicit representation, which I found very important, which has many applications. This is if your ground space is a tree, a rooted tree. Uh, and let's, let's just think of it like this. Uh, you have a complete, more or less complicated tree, and then let's somehow go to the, to the leaves here. And let's say we have these number of red particles or boxes or whatever, which have to be transported to the, to the blue ones. And then of course you see that there is some place like here where the mass is, is, is well matched and that there is other places uh, where this is not the case. Um, so uh, what you would do is uh, you would first start maybe with the leaves and see whether you can somehow equalize uh, that. Uh, for example, uh, what you have here is here, everything seems to be okay, but here is a red one, which somehow has to match with a blue one, but then you have here too many red ones and so on. Uh, so what you're gonna do is you will send this, this red one because you have to, to, to match it somehow with, with the blue one, maybe uh, just to the parent uh, and, and, and shift this mass a level higher. Uh, and the other way around, if you are down here, uh, you, you have to somehow equalize uh, the three particles in the leaf. So you will take a red one from here and shift it down. Uh, and then you can proceed further uh, until uh, you get uh, everything balanced uh, and then you can go a level higher. So if you then go a level higher, uh, then you still have two red dots, which, which are too many here. And then you have to send them somehow upwards to the, to the parents of this 
of this leaf here. And again, as I said, it's a tree, uh, a rooted tree. So remember uh, that there cannot be any cycles like in a general graph. Uh, and that's, that's very important. So if you want to um, write down this in a formula, then actually you see that uh, the, the total cost, uh, the optimal transport cost with respect to, to, to uh, uh, a metric on the on 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 a tree, uh, uh, which which comes from the from the weights uh, between uh, uh, nodes uh, and its parents, uh, you get that the total cost is the transport cost between a node and its parent multiplied with the, the difference uh, in total mass uh, of the corresponding subtree, uh, which consists of all the children below, and you get an absolute value here because in a sense uh, you that doesn't distinguish whether you transport into a node or whether you take mass from a node. And in fact, uh, this is very helpful, such a closed, closed formula uh, for that specific situation. And there is uh, several applications uh, where people use uh, uh, successfully Wasserstein uh, distance uh, based um, or Wasserstein distances on, on trees uh, in metagenomics, for example. Uh, and uh, there is also recent uh, minimax uh, uh, estimation theory uh, by uh, Wang and co-authors, uh, just appeared in JASA. So another, uh, and I will not go into detail he here, but another very important uh, uh, explicit expression, which is very useful, is um, if you um, have what is called the ultrametric tree. And ultrametric tree, again, it should be rooted. Uh, actually, it doesn't matter. You can, if you have a tree, you can take any point. Uh, as, as a root in a sense. And then uh, what um, ultrametric uh, makes ultrametric tree is that in fact, the distance between uh, the leaves and the root is always the same. So you may maybe think of a dyadic uh, partition system or whatever. Uh, and here the mass is actually not sitting on the entire tree. The mass is only sitting uh, on the leaves. Uh, and, and then you, you, you define an ultrametric tree uh, on that. Uh, and what you then can show is that you get a, let's say, similar uh, explicit formula in a sense. Um, and this depends on what is called a hate function. What is very useful here is that you can do that not only for the L1 norm, as I did before, uh, that's only doable, that's the only doable thing effectively for trees. Well, there is some generalizations. Here you can do it uh, actually for um, P norms. And uh, this depends on a, on a hate function, uh, which you can recursively compute. Uh, and that works because uh, roughly speaking, uh, if you have an ultrametric, then that to the exponent of P will define an ultrametric again. So, um, and that's a very useful uh, formula. And there is a, a very nice paper by uh, Benoit Klöckner on this uh, and, and, and also some subsequent uh, papers. So maybe uh, it is good to have a, 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 I don't know, a one or two minutes break. I already see that we have spent a lot of time. Um, so let me say that uh, now in the following, I would like to address uh, statistical uh, data analysis uh, type of questions. Uh, I will talk a little bit about computation and statistical uh, tools uh, and uh, hope to convince you that uh, optimal transport based statistical data analysis um, can be a potentially uh, very fruitful uh, direction to go. Thank you, Axel. Um, maybe we can take a few questions now. I, I already see that uh, Junjing Fan has raised his hand. Um, uh -huh. I will unmute you, uh, Jen Ching, if you can hear us and you can pose your question. Can you hear us, Jen Ching? Uh, Jen Ching, can you hear us? I can see your hand raising, but cannot hear you. Hmm. Oh, he... Now he stopped hand raising, so maybe it's he maybe Chenqing doesn't have a question anymore. Okay, so if there is no more questions, then let me talk a little bit about computational issues, and I think I have to speed up now uh, because there is not uh, not much time left. Um, 
So, as I said, uh, this is a, um, if you want to compute optimal transport, this is, a, a, first of all, a, a linear optimization problem. It's convex. Uh, and it's vanilla form. If you just look at it, it has n square unknowns, which are the elements in that in that transition matrix, uh, and two n minus one constraints. Um, well, this can be casted, of course, in the framework of of general linear program, and 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 but that's more general. Uh, and then, if you read it this way, you can also look to the dual formulation. Then you see actually that the solution of such a problem can only have two n minus one support points. So in a sense, a solution of an optimal transport problem is really sparse. Um, so if you look to general algorithms, like for example, the Silbeck algorithm, uh, which works for general linear programs, uh, this has in a worst case, actually exponential runtime and there is a, a, a whole plethora of very smart and intelligent algorithms. Uh, for example, uh, Bertzika's um, auction algorithm, uh, which are directly tailored or have been tailored then later on to optimal transport. Um, and you can also view it as a network flow problem and, and much of it is, 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 is um, actually resulting from there. Um, I will not go into detail here. The auction algorithm, in a sense, can be can be thought of that you have n contractors, which are let's say compete for n projects, if you want to put it this way. Uh, and uh, there is a bidding and an update phase, and then you try to get an equilibrium, and the optimal assignment is exactly uh, achieved at that equilibrium, and that gives you an iterative algorithm. And for this, for example, you can show uh, that it has a, a worst case runtime of of uh, cubic n times a log factor. So, but still, if you, for example, would uh, uh, use this vanilla on an image, uh, which is of the size roughly thousand times thousand, so it has a, a million uh, pixels, and you would read each pixel as a, as a, as a, as one point in your space, uh, then actually you would see that you require about ten to the to the eighteen number of operations or elementary operations to compute that, uh, and that would require on my laptop. Uh, which maybe is not the best one, but about three years. So you see computation is really a bottleneck and it's extremely important to have uh, uh, good and fast algorithms uh, to deal with large scale problems. In fact, there is a, a, a huge development uh, which, which, which we've seen in the last, let's say 10 years and modern uh, optimal transport solver, which are really tailor suited to the specific geometry of the problem. For example, in images, you have a, you have a grid or which are tailor suited to the specific cost function. Like for example, the L1 function, because the dual is so simple, allows actually a lot of uh, um, improved algorithms uh, is extremely helpful. And there is a, a huge, uh, as I said, a huge development going on. You also can, can of course relax the problem further. For example, you can look to surrogate functional like the, the sliced Wasserstein distance, which in a sense is an average over one dimensional projection uh, and, and other surrogates. Let me maybe uh, very quickly uh, talk about this one, uh, that synchronous algorithm. Uh, and here, uh, what you do is you penalize uh, with uh, an entropy term. And uh, this now makes the convex optimization function to a strictly convex one, uh, which then has a unique solution. That's a, that's a big benefit, of course. Um, nevertheless, if you look to it, um, this depends on the penalty parameter, let's, let's call it lambda, a non-negative penalty parameter. Then you see as lambda approaches zero, you get the um, optimal transport solution. But if lambda is a little larger, you get, you, you, you get something which is not sparse at all. Uh, and this is really due to that penalty term because you, 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 this enforces you to have in a sense, big entropy. So uh, nevertheless, this uh, and, and related, formulations of that problem have uh, actually achieved a lot of interest because that can be computed very fast and simple. Uh, it's a strictly convex smooth problem now, so you can solve just the first order Lagrangian, uh, which gives you a solution. And then you see, and this really is very much linked to this, um, to this um, specific entropy penalty, then you see actually that you get just a diagonal multiplication of a matrix, uh, which you then iteratively uh, can update 
uh, and then you get uh, what is called then the synchronous algorithm out of it, which has been very much propagated by Marco Couturi and co-authors. Uh, and there is many variants uh, nowadays around uh, for this one. Uh, and that can actually uh, uh, work in, let's say, quadratic time or even faster. So still computation is a bottleneck for, I think, for, for routine optimal transport-based data analysis. And one has to be careful with, with algorithms, uh, what, they, what they provide. And I only addressed very few issues here. Memory is an issue. Parallelization is, of course, an issue. And, and, and which ones are available in software? So here, I would like to give a very simple, um, let's say, statistical randomization scheme, which, in a sense, is, is, is a bootstrap or resampling idea. Uh, which you can combine with, with any backend solver, which, which, which you would like to do. And, and imagine the following scenario. Uh, let's say you have two images here, two grayscale images for simplicity and, and scale them to one. So I look at it as, as probability distributions, discrete probability distributions on the pixels. And if I take a, a standard algorithm like the auction, my implementation that would take about five minutes to compute the optimal transport between uh, my students, uh, Marcel Klatt and, and Florian, who kindly agreed to serve here as test beds. Um, so what I could do is I could, of course, randomly resample according to the intensity in that images. So you would get pictures like this here. And these have only uh, now a support of about 1,000 pixels. And here I can, using the same algorithm, I can just uh, compute that optimal transport within a second. And the optimal transport cost, which I get here is about 0 0.02. Uh, that is not so important what that number means, but uh, let's see what happens if we repeat. So if I draw another random thousand pixels, I see that uh, this doesn't change very much. Uh, and so I can repeat that maybe a few times, or let's say 10 times, and take the average. And then what I get is, in a runtime of 12 seconds in this case, I get uh, a number which is 0 0.0225. And if I compute exactly the optimal transport, which I can do for this small scale uh, problem, then I get 0 0.0217. So actually, you see that here is only a loss in accuracy of about 3%, but I gained in speed by a factor of 25. And the reason is very simple. The reason is that I have downscaled, in a sense, each, each problem uh, from, let's say, cubic runtime, which has cubic runtime, let's say, uh, to, to a subsample, which is much smaller. And then I just take a few of these, of these uh, OT, estimated OT values and average. So um, this is. It turns out actually that the number of repetition of that is not very important. So if you just do like two, three, four, or five is fully sufficient. What really matters here is actually the empirical or the, the approximation error, the expected approximation error uh, between this estimated optimal transport uh, and, and the true one between these images. So you can uh, do some theory for this. And, and this is built on, on, I will be very brief here, on a, on a lot of uh, uh, theory which, which has been developed uh, much deeper in, in the context of empirical processes, um, for example. And what I do here is I we fine tune everything um, to the, the, the discretization. So I really work in finite spaces. And then I can get very explicit expressions uh, by actually approximating the expected um, error between this estimated or this empirical optimal transport thing uh, minus the true one um, by actually an ultrametric tree. Uh, that's why, why I showed that before. Uh, and controlling that uh, with, um, with covering arguments or, or covering uh, uh, that, 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 that tree and uh, the metric space, the underlying metric space. So n uh, is here certain covering numbers. And then if you um, do that for um, a gridded system, uh, like an image, or, or let's say a d-dimensional cube, discrete cube, uh, then actually you can bound that uh, uh, reasonably. Uh, and then you get the following. Um, and this is that uh, this average error is bounded um, well, by something which is 
uh, very obvious, and this is the number of samples you take to the power of minus one divided by two p. If p is one, this is just uh, one over square root of s, which is the number of samples you, you, you choose. But then the constant is interesting uh, because here you can relate the constant very, very precisely to this discretization. And so what you get is uh, you get something uh, if you um, put it to the um, discrete Euclidean cube, uh, then you see actually if the dimension of this cube is less uh, or equal to three, so an image would have dimension two, and if the transport or if the, uh, the Wasserstein distance uh, here is a metric is a squared Euclidean distance, uh, then you see in fact that this approximation error, expected approximation error is completely independent of the size of the image. And only if the dimension gets four or larger, it starts to depend on the image. Or dimension four logarithmically and then uh, polynomial. Um, well, so you can do simulation studies and, 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 and there you can see this effect uh, very nicely and actually it can be shown that in a sense, these constants are sharp up, well, sharp up to some other small constants. Uh, so for example, here you see that if I am uh, willing to allow 3% statistical error on average, uh, then I can gain uh, at least a factor 100 of runtime of my original algorithm, whatever algorithm I have used. And if I'm willing to allow, let's say, 8% error, then I can gain a factor of 10,000. And that's really magnitudes, magnitudes larger. Of course, I do a statistical error, but this appears to be relatively small. So um, I don't know how much time is, is, is left. Uh, five minutes. Victor, is that true or somebody? Um, no, actually, so, we, have, we still have quite a bit of time. Uh, okay, the, so the then session, let me see how yeah. far how far I get. Uh, let me maybe ver very quickly talk about um, some applications, uh, OT Berry centers. Uh, so what you can do is, of course, uh, you can compute Frechet means uh, with respect uh, to, to an ensemble of, let's say, n probability measures. And you can also do that with respect to the optimal transport distance. Uh, for example, here is a maybe an illustrative uh, eye catcher uh, if you just take the Euclidean mean of some uh, random ellipses or triangles, you will get something, something fuzzy here on the left. Uh, and if you uh, compute uh, the optimal transport, a barycenter, a generalized mean, uh, which minimizes this free functional, you would get here an, an ellipse, and here you would get effectively a triangle. For this specific situation that can be proved, let's say if the triangles are not too, too wild, uh, but it somehow suggests that it seems that optimal transport pertains some parts, at least, of the underlying geometry of the structures. And that's obviously a very beneficial um, um, thing. And there is a lot of work in, in, in that direction on optimal transport body centers. I will not go into detail. Let me just uh, um, point to a session tomorrow. Uh, there is a talk by uh, Joaf Semel. And unfortunately, Alexandra Suvorikova Sub Sub has, has canceled, I think. Uh, which uh, gives much more details on, on optimal transport-based uh, barrier centers. Uh, here you just see some illustrations we got in combination actually with this random uh, resampling algorithm because the barrier center problem to compute is actually uh, much more difficult than already the optimal transport problem itself. Um, so, Let's, let's come to some uh, genuinely statistical questions like, like limit laws, uh, which you may use uh, for, for inferential purposes. Um, so, and that's maybe quite, quite, quite interesting to see what happens for these finite spaces, uh, because um, here you can actually fully characterize uh, asymptotic uh, distributions. Um, here is one setting. Uh, let's say we have a, a finite metric space with n numbers. Actually, the metric doesn't matter here. You could take a general cost function. And let's say we have IID uh, random variables according to that, to, to a probability vector living on this um, finite space. Um, and then when the number of, of observation goes to infinity, you get the following. If you take the Wasserstein distance uh, between uh, the empirical one and the true one, uh, then the scaling rate is n to the power of one divided by two p, and this converges uh, to the maximum over a Gaussian uh, 
um, take it, the underlying Gaussian process or, or Gaussian multivariate Gaussian law comes just from the limit of the of the of the multinomial law of the of the uh, resampling of the um, finite measure R, but but then you get a maximum uh, which is characterized actually by uh, taking all the optimal dual solutions. Uh, so here really duality comes in, and that's actually uh, not difficult to prove. But uh, the the typical situation here is really that the, the limit is not normal. Um, and important to note is here that you really compare uh, the sampled measure with the truths. And then actually it turns out that the, this set of dual solutions uh, cannot have one element, it must have more in general. And, 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 and so you get really a maximum over such a Gaussian ensemble. Uh, the situation becomes uh, different actually when you compare with a Wasserstein distance between, between different measures. So think of these two images we've seen before, that would be two different measures R and S, obviously people are not the same. Um, and then the scaling becomes generically square root of N. So that becomes generically square root of N. Um, and formally you can write down it the same way, but typically what happens is actually that this maximum collapses in a sense to, to, to a single point. So it, this becomes a Gaussian variable. So the limit is normal under certain assumptions. Uh, and one assumption is that the probability measures or distributions R and S have to be, let's say, in a sense, different enough. So um, how to prove that is uh, you just take the underlying uh, multinomial, the limit of the multinomial, and then uh, you use um, a, a delta method. Uh, and the modification maybe to, to what is generally used or, or known is that here you can in fact uh, prove that uh, the, um, the, the, the optimal uh, value of this, of this optimization problem uh, is uh, Hadamard differentiable, uh, but in a nonlinear sense. Uh, and, and there is a, a lot of, of, of literature on, the, on that. And this is what you, uh, what you can apply here. And then you can compute the, the derivative uh, which is given by another optimization problem. And this is exactly what kicks in, uh, uh, in, in, in the limit. So I will not go into detail here, uh, but potentially uh, uh, you can use that, of course, for, for inferential purposes. Um, let me quickly make a comment uh, how to extend now from finite spaces uh, to more complicated situation. And now things become uh, difficult. Uh, you can go, for example, to countable spaces. Already here, uh, let's say if you exclude accumulation points, uh, uh, things are not so easy anymore. And, and you can extend some of these arguments, uh, but then you have to work with, with proper norms and you get conditions actually uh, to the underlying measures, uh, condition which, which, is, which, which somehow Makes you staying away from 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 a uniform measure, for example. So it's 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 uh, very much related to to the Borisov uh, Dors condition uh, that the sum of the square root of the masses is is, is finite. Uh, here is a metric, the underlying metric of the space uh, uh, enters as well. So um, you can extend these things uh, to multi samples. Uh, and do something like a, let's say, Wasserstein ANOVA thing uh, and so on, uh, and, and, and apply uh, this, for example, we did uh, in order to distinguish between uh, a fake and a natural uh, fingerprint. We, we took the minutiae patterns of this fingerprint uh, and, and compared these uh, with optimal transport methods. I will not go into detail here. Um, so, you can also exploit, and that shouldn't be very surprising now, uh, the same thing uh, on trees. And then you get an explicit representation for, for, for limit on a tree. Uh, and a very particular case, and that's, I think, one of the first results in that direction I've seen is by, by, by Samuels and Johnson. And that's a very specific tree because they just consider a totally ordered finite subset of the reals. And this is, of course, a very simple tree with one root, and each parent has exactly one children. Uh, and so this is a particular case of that. Um, 
while you can do much more and 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 because time is is progressing i will not will not go into in, into detail here but let me say that in particular um for dimension one uh, there is a is a long history uh, of of limit laws uh, in in the continuous case which are much more involved actually uh, and also recently, uh, there is work by uh, Elvaria and Lubes uh, who, who were able uh, to uh, say something on, on, or to, to, to prove a central limit theorem uh, for, for measures, uh, the back continuous measures on, on, on uh, the d dimensional space and so on. And that's a very active uh, area currently, this type of limit laws. So, what happens? Uh, for the OT plan, and that's a very recent result uh, uh, with uh, Marcel Klapp and, and, and Joab Simel. Um, and so far, we only look to the value, uh, the optimal value, but you can, of course, also look to the optimal plan. And actually, I argue that for many statistical purposes, the optimal transport plan is actually the thing uh, where you can do a lot with. It's not only the optimal value. Well, roughly speaking, uh, as you again do a perturbation analysis, and as long as you stay, let's say, within uh, a certain phase uh, of that uh, polyhedron where you're optimal, uh, you, nothing uh, changes in a sense, uh, and you just stay asymptotically normal. Things become uh, more tricky when you start to, 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 to go from vertices to phases or cross even these phases, because then actually um, new fundamental solution to the, to the corresponding linear program uh, uh, kick in. And then what you get is uh, really conditioned on these events and, and they have asymptotically really positive probability. Uh, you have to distinguish these, these cases. You can put that together if you like in a, in a more or less complicated law. Here it is tailor suited to optimal transport. You can do that for linear programs uh, more generally. Uh, and then you get asymptotically, let's say a kind of mixture of, of normals, uh, roughly speaking, uh, where these, these mixture components really depend on, on, on the, the, the faces of the polyhedral cones, uh, which contain the, the feasible perturbations. Uh, the situation is very different if you go to entropy regularization. Um, and uh, entropy regularization, uh, we discussed already. Uh, uh, or I, I mentioned it quickly. Uh, and this is uh, that you penalize uh, with such a, um, um, such a uh, entropy penalty term, uh, which makes your solution more, let's say, fuzzy uh, and not so sparse anymore, at least for, let's say, large values of lambda. And it has a unique solution. And in fact, there uh, generically, uh, the asymptotic limit is, 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 is just normal with a square root of n ring. Um, actually, what is interesting is, of course, if this penalization parameter goes to zero, right, uh, then you should enter, or, or you, you, you will collapse in a sense, or enter in the original optimal transport problem. And, and if you look to these type of laws, obviously you cannot go to this limit because here is a very different scale. And it has also a, a different uh, limit law. And in fact, what you see is, and that's also what you see numerically, if you do this kind of perturbation analysis for small lambda, then actually you see just from this that, for example, take p equal two, uh, that you get n to the power um, of a quarter as a scaling rate for the, for the original optimal transport problem. And if you square this, then you get the square root of n. So you see that if lambda goes to zero, in a sense, the problem becomes quadratically more quadratically instable, so or more ill posed. And this is exactly what is reflected in this limit law, and that's also what you see in America. Uh, I will skip that, uh, and maybe I will also um, skip. Um, let me see what's about the time. Um, well, or maybe let me give you a brief application where we recently have used optimal transport in its vanilla form, actually, and there should be and, and has to be much more to said. And this is a colocalization analysis in super resolution imaging. Um, roughly speaking, colocalization and it means, and that's that is not a really crisp and 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 I don't know 
statistically or mathematically sound notion in a sense of spatial proximity between protein structures uh, in, in a cell, for example, to investigate interaction networks, biochemical interaction networks. Um, and uh, there is a lot of methodology and, 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 and a lot of progress in, in, in the last years, um, in particular because there has been a lot of progress in, in microscopy itself, in super, what is called then nowadays super resolution microscopy. So what you see here, for example, is a so-called confocal microscope. It's already a complicated uh, laser microscope. And you see two protein structures uh, of the mito which, which act in the mitochondria. This is TOM20 and MIG60. It's, it's not so important at the moment what that is. Uh, but you see somehow that they are spatially or seem to be spatially quite, quite correlated. That's what you see in this, maybe in this overlap image. And what you could simply do is you, I don't know, just vectorize the image and compute the Pearson correlation coefficient and then would get a very large number here in this case, maybe 0 0.8 larger. Um, well, if you use a modern uh, uh, super resolution microscope uh, like stimulated emission depletion, uh, then you see these structures much more resolved. Uh, but if you would gen just compute naively an image correlation, uh, then you would just find that they're almost uncorrelated. And so obviously uh, we need spatial correlation measures in order to describe that. And optimal transport uh, offers uh, uh, in a way uh, a methodology for that. And so what I do is I um, call an optimal transport collocation a curve, and that's really now a curve, um, the amount of, of mass, which in a sense is transported up to a given scale. So here T denotes, let's say a certain, let's say spatial scale measured in terms of a metric that could be Euclidean metric or whatever. And pi star here means already the optimal transport solution. And, um, just to visualize, uh, if you have two images here, like uh, on the right-hand side, uh, and if you want to transport uh, that simple structure here uh, from the red to the greens, then you just have to do in a sense that by one, one pixel shift more or less. Uh, and if you do that uh, for that image structure, then you have to do it here by two pixel shifts and here by one pixel shift. And this is exactly um, visualized in this, in this transport curve. Uh, it will make a jump uh, for the for the for the first case uh, just exactly at this uh, at one scale, and and for the second one, uh, it 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 will have uh, two two jumps. Uh, so for the second image, which is a green curve, sorry, the first one was a red curve. Uh, so these OTC curves, in a sense, aim to capture the spatial scales, um, and you can uh, then uh, apply this uh, to colocalization images. Before I do that, let me just illustrate uh, here another example uh, where I show you what is called the geodesic flow. We have seen that, that, that before. This, in a sense, tells you how much mass in an optimal transport sense at a specific pixel is transported from somewhere to this pixel. And it's all brought to the same time scale. Uh, so if you let run this, uh, let me do that then you see uh, actually between TOM20 and, and ATPS, this is a, a protein which is relevant for ATPS synthesis, um, that almost nothing happens. Also the Pearson correlation between the, let's say the green and the red structure would be here uh, pretty high. Um, if you express this in OTC curves then actually you see that beyond 50 nanometers, this is not really physical scale, um, about, 32% of mass is just pertained. And if you go to 60 nanometer scale, already 70% of mass is, has been transported to match the other structure. If you do that thing uh, with a MIG-60 complex, uh, and here's a Pearson coefficient uh, is practically the same, uh, then you see actually much more things going on. And you need much more mass to move, to transport one structure into the other. So beyond 50 nanometers, for example, there is just 6% transported and, and below 60 nanometers, there's 15% transported. Uh, so you can express this uh, and, and look to these OTC curves. Uh, well, we have undergone a, a, large, uh, a large study with, with many, many measures which, which, which have been suggested for colocalization analysis. And um, we did that on... Um, Test beds. We did that on um, um, on real measurement on, on real stat data, um, and what we found is uh, actually that 
most of these measures do not really give a concise answer if you let's say increase the the degree of colocalization in a reasonable sense uh, we did that for for many or for many different structures which somehow uh, resemble uh, certain protein uh, structures and alignments uh, and if you do that with these uh, OTC curves, uh, then actually you get a pretty consistent uh, and, and, and clear answer uh, in all these cases. I will not go into detail here. There, there must be or should be much more said. Um, and there is issues, of course. Uh, one is that the optimal transport plan is not unique. You can use penalized optimal transport, uh, which, which we also did, uh, which gives you, uh, let's say, similar answers. Um, computation is here a, a big issue. I did not talk, talk on this at all. We randomly actually selected uh, sub images from this big image in order to com compute things. Um, I, we did not take into account convolution, also not for super resolution microscopy, which is still prone to convolution. Uh, and also the stoichiometry is not respected. Uh, we, are, we just did a very first uh, study, let's say. Uh, that means typically the number of proteins uh, are not the same. Uh, this part of the mitochondria, and this somehow uh, should have to be respected. Um, so if I see it correctly, time uh, elapsed a lot, and um, I um, probably would skip the last part of this, of this talk where I wanted to talk a little bit about um, optimal transport as a potential way to measure uh, dependency. Um, and maybe let me uh, summarize here at this point. Um, so what I believe is that in fact, optimal transport, maybe not as vanilla concept, but there is many variations of it. Uh, distance and in particular also the plan. Um, that means the transition matrix appears to be a very useful quantity for many purposes of, of daily uh, data analysis. A computation inference in a sense is Still, all already a lot is, has been explored, but still, in a sense, at its infancy, if you really want to treat large scale uh, and, 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 and modern applications. Um, there is many variations which I didn't address, uh, like unbalanced transport and, and, and other measures of association and so on. Um, but what I think is that, um, or I hope that I have um, convinced you that it, it OT, in a sense, uh, pertains certain, uh, let's say, geometry of the ground problem, uh, which in many situations, if you think of very centers, uh, can be very um, advantageous. There is um, um, further developments on this, uh, like, for example, the gromov wasserstein distance, which respects um, the, the inner geometry, let's say, of a data set. For example, what you see here on the left-hand side is just uh, the optimal transport between the, the red dots and the blue ones, and that's just obvious transport which you maybe would expect what happens here but if you read the red dots let's say as a triangle and the blue dots as a triangle then the gromov wasserstein distance actually um, which reads it then as a metric measure space uh, would not just match this way it would really uh, take this triangle and move it or match it actually to the to, to, to the blue triangle in a most cost efficient way so it is allowed, in a sense, to do these computations modulo, uh, in that case, Euclidean, Euclidean transformations. So I'm aware that uh, I only addressed a very few issues uh, already. Uh, time is, time is uh, uh, progressing uh, very fast. Um, there is many, many more, like causality we have seen in Philippe Rivoli's talk, graph alignment problems, uh, rank-based testing. Uh, there's a lot of beautiful work by Mark Law, Chano Supov, and co-authors, time series analysis, and so on. So that the bad part in the sense of my talk that I didn't address all these issues. Um, the, the, the good message is uh, that, in fact, uh, this is all uh, at JSM available. Uh, many talks we have seen already about it, and there is still a uh, few more talks to, to come. So thanks a lot uh, for your patience. Thank you very much indeed, Axel, for a very stimulating and very interesting talk. I would like to invite questions from the participants. Let me just remind you, you can either raise your hand and I can unmute you on Zoom. Um, alternatively, you can submit your question in the chat uh, field in Zoom, and I can read it out to Axel. 
Um, um, and finally, there is the chat function on Pathable, and you can use that as well. It will keep track of all these channels. Perhaps I could kick off with, with a question. I was intuitively, uh, um, it made sense to me intuitively that when you spoke about calculating the Wasserstein distance via subsampling, that, that, that things would work quite well. What struck me was uh, a set of pictures you showed um, with optimal transport barycenters, I think it was slide 61, where it seemed that you had a number of geometric shapes um yeah i just try to and you, yes thank you uh, this one this yes, what you mean? yes correct so you have a number of geometric shapes and you've subsampled them so you've discretized them and then then you do a discrete barycenter and it it looks like what it should now from what I know, you know, you you would have horrible non-uniqueness in general with with discrete barycenters, and I wanted to ask you, why does it work in this case? Is it because the object that has been subsampled is is somehow so nice and 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 somehow it has a, a a geometric embedding rather than just being something discrete? Um, um, how does this how does this work out so nicely? Um, <laughs> uh, that's 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 a, that's a good question. Um, well, probably. I, I mean, probably because probably because uh, this uh, geometric structure, let's say, in a sense, for all this object is kind of systematic. It's 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 very similar. It's all the same. I mean, why I showed that is in particular to illustrate that, in a sense, optimal transport pertains this geometric structure. And this is not clear to me at all how that works actually, right? I mean, for very simple situations, you can do some computations, but in general, um, there is no reason why that should hold. Uh, and, but it's, it still seems to, to, to be the case. So um, besides of, um, let's say numerical issues with the computation of, of very centers. Uh, so, um, so maybe to, to change the question a bit, do you expect that if in one of these rows, you, you sort of uh, replaced one of the entries in one of the rows by an entry from another row, would you expect the barycenter to still somehow remain relatively stable, change a little bit because you've, 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 you've contaminated your, your, your collection, uh, or do you expect it to somehow break down? No, Victor, say, ask, sorry, ask the question again. You want to exchange the rows? Right. Uh, so, so I, if, if so, I so here, if I here, here to understand, right? Here's the computation. Here's the images are to understand only row wise, right? I took the first row. Yes, yes, yes. And then I, yes. I and then I sampled from them uh, from, and, and from and then each, you get the from each of the five objects I sampled, and then we we computed the barycenter corresponding to this because this Correct. is what you compute uh, for Correct. the original ones. You already cannot. It's, it's out of, of computational uh, and so in this context I, you know my initial question was about i was i was intrigued that the barycenter looks to be you know the right barycenter of, of, of possibly many optima that you might have in in, in the discrete problem and i wonder uh -huh. about stability so i'm saying i understand that you take barycenter as row wise but now suppose that i take you know a, an entry from the fifth column and I add it into the, uh, sorry, from the fifth row, and I add it into the first row, uh, would you expect things, or have you done a computation? Can you say if it, does it break down no. completely? And do you get, no, it doesn't break down. You, you want to add it in the first row? You uh, want to Yes, in some sense, I want to, I want to replace uh -huh, one of the I elements see. in the first row with something that is quite a bit different as a shape. Yeah, yeah, I understand. So for example, I could I could just topologically say, pertain very the way. original and could pertain the, the I could 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 just keep the original one in the first row and then maybe subsample from the others. Exactly. Um, this is well 
I, I cannot give you a, a, a clear and crisp answer to this question. So, but um, what is definitively true is that um, while well, we have conjectures and, and actually Joaf is going to talk about this tomorrow um, about the support points of Barry Sanders. And here um, it will, I, I so what will happen here is in, in a sense that um, the support that the support of this 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 computed barry center of all the all the five uh, let's say uh, examples if, if i would do another another sample then probably the support of these barry centers will be very similar that's what i would conjecture so of course i mean if you if you would draw but this is just to the random drawing if you would draw from one of the objects just by accident, let's say some very irregular point, then of course this could mess up things definitively. Um, but that's maybe not so much due to the Barry Center computation. And actually, of course, what you could try to do is you could try to combine this. And, and I don't want to advocate that for Barry Centers necessarily you should do this resampling. I just did that because or showed that because so far I think Barry Centers of such complicated objects never have been shown to my best of my knowledge. We, because computationally it's just infeasible to do. And, and if you do this resample, you still can see at least something. So, but that's certainly not, I mean, the, if we would have better ways to compute that would be much, uh, I think, uh, much more preferable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Axel. Uh, so we have some questions in, in, in the chat. So Ning Ning is asking, um, I wonder uh, if the last mentioned Wasserstein distance that preserve the data structure is quite useful to handle dependence, such as time dependence or spatial dependence? Uh, in fact, uh, thanks for this question in a sense. So I skipped uh, because I realized that I, I think I ran out of time. I skipped the last part of my talk uh, where I try to discuss a little bit how um, optimal transport or Wasserstein metric could be used for describing dependence. Um, and of course, we there is different notions of, of statistical dependence. Uh, the, it, I think it's clear what we all mean by independence, but what means dependence is not so clear. For example, if you see these data sets here, right, then on the left hand side, probably you would say, well, this is highly dependent, and probably all, also this V structure, maybe that in the in, on the right hand side looks very random in a sense. So, well, in fact, this is in a sense true, and in a sense, it's not true. Also, that on the left hand side comes actually from a function. I just didn't, didn't show you. Uh, and the question is, what can you do with, with optimal transport? And what you can do is uh, you can do the following. Um, let me be very quick here. You can measure, and now the cost function, of course, plays a crucial role, the dependency structure um, of something which has marginals, let's say mu and u, with the independent property in the, in, in the optimal transport way. Um, and then it turns out if you plug in different cost functionals, um, like for example, Lip an alpha Lipschitz cost function or Lipschitz norm, that you get notions of dependency uh, which measure um, dependency, for example, like how well can I describe my data with a Lipschitz function, as we've, as we've seen in this example. And you can also go to the extremes and then you would just come to, 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 to the question, well, is there a measurable function which, which, which correlates somehow the, 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 or links it or aligns the data? Um, and that's, a, that's, that's maybe the, a, a very rough uh, dependency concept in the sense that you don't, you don't see, for example, such a fine structure here. Um, and so you can fine tune it actually to several of these of, of, of ways of, of measuring dependency. And there is work on that uh, already by, by several people, uh, uh, like for example, by um, Ozair in the machine learning com community and Xiao who suggested first versions to, to do that. And then there is a more principled work by Maldon and Seegers and also by Wiesel who investigates certain of these concepts statistically. And if you treat it in a very, in that very general framework, then actually you can see that a lot of dependency concepts come out in special cases in a certain sense. So the answer is yes, I believe that um, 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 you can use that. And actually what I should mention is that uh, if you want to come something like a, let's say a, a coefficient of dependency, like, like a Pearson correlation coefficient, which is standardized between zero and one, you can try to do that. And for this, you need certain bounds 
uh, for this dependency, and that can be done uh, for specific situations. For example, uh, you can you can then show if that such a correlation coefficient is one exactly if the dependency is is given um, or if the if the um, um, transition probability is is given by a, a function. So the, the the optimal transport coupling collapses. Uh, really to a, to, a, to a function now, to a Morse function uh, for an alpha Lipschitz function. Uh, and, and also for other functions, you can do that. Uh, for example, for an, an isometry uh, and so on. Thank you very much, Axel. So I have two more questions already uh, queued up. Uh, first by Miranda Lynch and then by Joab Zemel. So Miranda is asking, uh, it is counterintuitive that the number of resamples for the image data, for instance, the number of times the sub something occurs, doesn't seem to have much impact. Could this be elaborated on? Does the quantity uh, of subsampling matter? What percentage of original data points are included? Um, okay. Um, that, that's, that's a good question. So, so first of all, numeric, I mean, just by many Monte Carlo simulations we, we, we run on, on, on many test beds, we just realized that in fact, the, sub, the, the, the what I call B, the number of subsamples really doesn't matter. So I think in this elementary example here, B was 10 repetitions, but five would be also good. And if you would do hundred, you wouldn't gain. Um, actually, the reason is simply that in fact, the, 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 the up, let's say, let's call it the approximation error or the expected approximation error to, to recover the optimal transport value is, is just more severe. So it just dominates the problem. It's not so much the variability within, with, with, within the data. The, the, so so um, it is difficult in a sense to balance out these, these, these two expressions be, be, because they measure different features in a sense, in a sense of the problem. Um, and I, I cannot give you, let's say, a mathematical or statistically crisp answer. So it's just what, 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 what we found. I mean, the whole thing scales in terms of B, uh, like, like a, a, a simple variance of an average does, right? So it's, it's, it, it scales like one over B or one over square root of B. It matters how you standardize. Uh, and this is just of, just of minor magnitude typically. That's what we found. Thank you, Axel. Um, now the next question uh, is by Joab Zemo. Joab, uh, you can unmute yourself and pose your question if you wish. Hi, Joab. So thank you, Victor, and th thank you, Axel, for this great talk. Um, I had a short comment regarding um, Victor's first question, and then perhaps a longer question to Axel. Um, so just in, in terms of the uniqueness of the biocenter, it's not really a problem if the biocenter is not unique. So the sum sampling the theory tells you that you will approximate one of the biocenters. So the non-uniqueness is not really a major issue, I would say. Um, and now I have a question for, to Axel um, regarding a different matter. Um, in, the countable, in the countably discrete um, case, you had these conditions. And, and my question is, what happens if these conditions fail to hold? Um, does it mean you have slower convergence rate or the limit is uh, not normal or uh, it's just Unknown. You mean I, I did that very quickly. Uh, I admit. Uh, I think what you mean is. Um, let me just go to that slide. Where is it? Uh, <laughs> uh, wait, it was computing. Um, I think what you mean is here. Is that right? Ah, uh, uh, no. You mean. You mean? Um, I think it, I think it was a bit before that. It was a bit before uh, this one. Yes, exactly. I, okay, okay. I, I was very quick here. Um, well, first of all, what, I mean, what we can show, in fact, is uh, that this condition um, with respect to this weighted L1 norm is in fact sharp in the sense that else the central limit theorem or this limit theorem doesn't hold anymore. This one. This doesn't mean that there might be another rescaling or I don't know what, but if you think, if you think, and, and, and I, I mean, we also did, did simulation and tried to explore that numerically. If you think about it, um, if 
you wouldn't need any of such condition, which in a sense is a concentration of measure condition, right? I mean, I mean, it means that the measure R or the, 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 the distribution R starts to concentrate. If you take the, the sum of the square roots, my, may, maybe let's say, if, let, let's assume that the space is bounded, right? Let's assume you are in the unit cube, then the D doesn't matter with this condition. And then you get the classical Boris of Durst condition, which gives you that the empirical process index in all subsets is, 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 is tight. Um, if you, start to, 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 to do, for example, the following. Uh, you take a unit square uh, and you discretize finer and finer. So then this condition will be violated asymptotically because you always have uniform distribution and then this does not hold. Uh, then you get a different limit law. Uh, or you, 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 we don't know what the limit is actually. So I just don't know. It. Um, and um, so this is in a sense, this in a sense resembles that there's, let's say the transition from the discrete to the continuous world. And that's, and that's I think pretty tricky. That's pretty tricky. Um, you should realize that this all kicks in or, or this all is when you sample um, from the reference measure you compare with. When they are different, so the Wasserstein distance between the Two, two, two measures is positive, then that all is asymptotically normal effective, essentially. So then things become much simpler. But in that situation, uh, that somehow means, intuitively speaking, that on finer and finer and finer scales, still some transport can happen, which can mess up things. So that's maybe a very uh, too rough explanation or whatever what's going on there. But it's, I think it's a very, very deep and tricky task. Maybe somebody in the auditorium knows from, from probability theory knows a much better answer to that. So I mean, there, I, I should mention again that there is a lot of work uh, done by, by, by many probabilists uh, uh, on these kind of, kind of issues uh, and statisticians as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Axel. Thank you, Joab. Any more questions or comments? Maybe a, a question of curiosity uh, in the problem of co-localization that you that you described. Does it happen that one ever wants to co-localize more than two proteins? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, actually, I I was very quick here again. So 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 this is actually a, a recent recording. Uh, from different protein structures where you see that these are already uh, three uh, different ones, the red, the yellow, and the, and the blue one. Actually, what we want to do is, and we are working on that, uh, is we would like to, to understand, um, let's say, biochemical pathways uh, uh, or, or see biochemical pathways, visualize biochemical pathways uh, here in this part, in this case, in the mitochondria uh, of, of uh, 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 a larger amount of proteins. And so typically these, these pathways undergo maybe 20, 30, 40 transitions. It is not possible to visualize it nowadays with microscopy, but what we can do or what my lab partners can do is that they can simultaneously now record, let's say three to five uh, of these proteins. So that would call for a, a, a multi a marginal transport, transport measures and, and, and things like that, where you want to see the alignment of these uh, in, a, in, a, in a reasonable and in, interpretable way. So absolutely, you're absolutely right. This is, this is where, the, where the technique goes and there are already um, um, step microscopes, for example, which can do that um, uh, for certain uh, amounts of different proteins, uh, a few ones like three, four, five, let's say, not more, then things become very complicated. Thank you very much. I have one more question. Uh, uh, Ning Ning asks, um, with regards to the majorization via trees proof idea, do you mm -hmm. mean that a tree structure is involved? Uh, the ultrametric tree structure is involved. So um, what you do is effectively, um, and, that's, uh, and that's an argument uh, which, which goes, which we, which we, which, we didn't invent this. This goes back, uh, I think, to to a paper by uh, 
Le Gouy and, and, and uh, a co-author. So let me see where it is. Uh, where is it? Um, somewhere. Uh, and was it here? No. Um, uh, I don't know, this is limited distribution, so it was before. Um, so what, well, anyway, so what you do is uh, you approximate, um, or you, 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 you want to cover uh, the metric space, the finite space with, with walls and, and control the entropy. Uh, and then you build an ultrametric tree on this, and then you bound it uh, with, with that ultrametric tree, and then you can estimate that very, very finely, and then you get these, uh, 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 these bounds. So it's not the tree, it's more the ultrametric tree which enters here. Um, I don't know if, if this possibly covers your follow up questioning, Ning, uh, whether it's possible to briefly describe the standard idea majorizing via tree. I think this probably covers it. If, if not, feel free to, to follow up. Well, we also can, can of course, dis dis discuss offline. Um, I don't know if there are any more questions or comments. We, we, we have five more minutes. We don't need to exhaust uh, all five minutes, but uh, do feel free to pose your question if, if you wish, since there's still time. So, uh... I just wanted to mention, Axel, that some uh, attendees have requested your talk slides. So maybe if you, you can actually upload your talk slides via yeah. uh, Partable. If you go on files, you will be able to upload it, I think. Okay, uh, so so I would I would transfer them to PDF first because at the moment, this is a oh. PPT presentation that's by far too big to upload. So, but but, but including videos and stuff, but but I will be, will, be, will be happy to do, yeah. Is, is it possible to do that later on or, or, or do I have to do it right now? No, 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 absolutely later on is fine. Absolutely fine. Uh, okay. I think the attendees can see these talks in the coming weeks also, or at okay. least can access the talks. So there is no okay. rush. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. I think there was also a request for a list of references. I, I, I imagine you don't have a, the detailed references, but. <laughs> Uh, uh, I, I suspect uh, that the references should suffice because you have both dates and journal abbreviations. So, I try so to do it this way because there is, and, and, and I still, I, I by far, by far, are not exhaustive at all about the reference. I should have mentioned much, much more. So, so it's still a lot, and I did it this way just to 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 make it. Uh, I hope this is this well is, to this save is, some space for, for for other stuff and. And I think if you if you just Google it this way, you should find it. And if you don't find it, uh, then you might also send me an email or whatever. So and contact me, and then I can. I can Thank you, Axel. Thank you very much. So if there are no more questions, uh, please join me in, in, in virtually uh, applauding Axel once again. Congratulations, Axel. Uh, thank you for a wonderful and enlightening lecture. Uh, well, thank uh, thanks for everyone pleasure. for attending. And, and hope to see you in some more uh, optimal transport related sessions. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, certainly tomorrow. Goodbye and thanks a lot to, to everybody of you for listening. And of course, to Bodhi and Victor for, for doing such an excellent job in guiding through this session. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Victor. Thanks, Axel. Thank, Thank you. So I'll just save the live transcript and then end the session. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for attending. Goodbye. Goodbye. Ooh, <sighs> oh, I'm going to hit you.